My name is Scott Edwards. I'm glad to be up here moderating the, the first half of the afternoon session. I work with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. I'm a private land biologist and also serve as our agency's wildlife research coordinator. And uh, so I'm very glad to be here today and work with the steering committee to put this uh, meeting symposium on. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Steve Grado. And Dr. Grado was my advisor as an undergraduate forestry program, so we go way back and I definitely uh, appreciate his influence in my life and getting me to this point where I am today. So he's going to be our first speaker, Dr. Grado. Professor with the Department of Forestry, Mississippi State. Thanks, Scott. Well, I'm uh, very glad to be here. And uh, Scott, is this the one everybody's using right here? Yes, sir. Okay, this is the one that's just going to carry right here. Yes. Oh, Well, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and then some of you folks that I don't know. Um, when I was asked to give this talk and then the one that I'm going to give later on this afternoon, I wasn't quite sure if it was going to be relevant uh, to the conversations that have gone on before this meeting. And um, as I sat through the presentations that have been given and as I've listened to some of the questions, I think I have a few points I'm going to make that maybe we'll shed some light or, or provide some insight on some of the things that we were discussing or asking questions on. As Scott said, I'm a professor of forestry uh, in the uh, Department of Forestry at Mississippi State University. The talk we have here is estimating the benefits of, and trade-offs of management for northern Bobway and eastern gray squirrel habitat in Mississippi's north central hills. This is a presentation that I dusted off, literally, from it goes back to around 2005. And I simplified it down quite a bit because this gets a little complicated. This is just a small part of what were two studies that we did that had many facets to them. Um, so I wanted to make, to give you a simple example of what we were trying to do. And what we were trying to do is basically talk about the trade-offs, the economic trade-offs when you manage for wildlife. What are the opportunity costs? Um, and so I think we give a, a, a rather simple rendition of it here. Um, the woman who led the research was Becky Barlow. She was working for Weyerhaeuser for about a dozen years. She had industry experience, and I thought that that would certainly bring, while she was getting her PhD, some relevance to the research, because the research oftentimes doesn't have relevance to the stakeholders, but she came from an industrial background, and I thought that was uh, of great benefit. The rest of the individuals that are, that are there contributed uh, from the standpoint of wildlife um, aspects of the project and also from some of the economic uh, analyses that we did. Well, Land managers, I, I may not use this because I think I'm, I'm loud enough as it is. At least that's what my wife tells me. Um, land managers often make decisions based on economic alternatives and oftentimes they want to maximize short-term returns on timber resources. One of my premises here is that we all think about economics. And if you're in industry, it's a primary objective. If you're a private landowner, as Tedrick has put, brought up there, economics plays a part in your landowner objectives. And you can make the argument in this day and age that agencies, more so than ever, at least have to, have to be more fiscally responsible. You know, maybe there, there are some agencies where there's a, a rate of return expected from some of their land holdings, but they at least have to account for how they spend their money, where they spend it. So economics is an important thing for all landowners. And you know, when you're selling timber or any other kind of commodity product, it's easy to trade it in the marketplace and you get a, re a dollar back and then you can calculate your return. Well, the monetary value of wildlife is harder to determine and, and it's difficult to compare the timber <coughs> values. And I know Scott Baker was asking about, um, you know, what's the value of, of um, timber, I mean of wildlife and what we're doing here is this isn't a willingness to pay study. This was something based on net present value accrued to a landowner and then what do you give up 
when you manage for certain types of wildlife. Okay, talk about the public and private landowners. And so basically, you know, information is needed on what it will cost for producing varying levels of wildlife habitat. Back in the early part of the last decade, um, there were a lot of people that were talking about this. Some had done some, some um, cursory studies, but I hadn't really seen any full-blown studies. So that's why we decided to engage on this. And we used a, a PhD student and a, a, a master's student to do two different uh, studies. One did more of the game and uh, maybe non-game species, but, but the other one did endangered species. And I have articles that were published on both of those studies and I have my card with me. I can't get into all the details here in 20 minutes, but I'd be happy to send you the articles if you, if you want to reply request. Okay, so the objectives were the effects of manipulating timber growing stock to produce wildlife habitat for northern bobwhite, eastern gray squirrel, evaluate the scenarios and maximize net present value and moderately low and moderately high quality habitat for both of these species, okay? So John talked about, you know, you can't really do an economic analysis on a seven acre stand. Well, here you're gonna see that we did it on a broad scale. So we painted a broad uh, brush. Maybe you might say it's too broad of a brush, but we certainly had a uh, very good sample in terms of what we were um, analyzing in terms of the values. And net present value, just real briefly, it's not a, a um, I don't have a lot of fancy pictures, not gonna be a lecture on economics, but you know, you wanna get your costs and benefits that, that you're incurring as you manage a piece of property. You wanna bring them back to point zero and so you can compare the costs and benefits all taking place at different points in time, at one point in time, and the net is when you subtract one from the other. It could either be a positive value or a negative value. Okay, these were the study areas that we uh, engaged in. This is the way the state is bro broken down. Um, for the purposes of this study right here, we did this uh, North Central Hills, which was this area right here. We looked at this for these two species. This wasn't the only area we looked at for these two species. It's the only area I looked at for these two species for this talk. Okay, the methodology, we used the FIA data. And not to uh, ruffle anybody's feathers, but we didn't have, at the time, the MIFI data, which is the state, which is the Mississippi-driven uh, Mississippi Institute for Forest Inventory data. It wasn't completed at the time, so the best available data that we had was the FIA data. And all I would say is the MIFI data would have been better suited for us because it was a little bit more robust in terms of the sample size, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> I'm not here, though, to talk about the inventory, except that when we did this study and we looked at a 50-year planning horizon, we needed to have a picture of what the land looked like from the standpoint of trees and forests for different ownerships at the time we initiated the study, which we went back to 1994. Talked about the wildlife, oh. <coughs> Talked about, how do I go back? No, oh, on the keyboard, yeah. You mean the arrows? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also used um, this model here uh, that the Forest Service developed called Spectrum 2.5. And with all the data that we collected, it went into Spectrum. And this was something that the Forest Service was very interested in because at the time, it was either a new version uh, of it or it was one of the, the initial versions. So we worked hand in hand with the Forest Service on trying to get this thing to run right. And they were very interested in uh, you know, what the results were gonna be from this study. And then of course we had our economic analysis. FIA data, uh, 1994 data for the state of Mississippi. And this just, just tells you a little bit about how that data is collected. The species that we considered, okay. Wildlife habitat quality. Here's where we, we uh, got a lot of our really good data. Um, we had habitat estimates from a mail survey that we did from wildlife professionals. And some of you in this audience might have filled out our survey. We had a pool of 56 wildlife professionals. And what we did is we searched long and hard by networking and finding out who had published what, who people knew, um, 
for example, Jeannie knew quite a few people. Not all 56 might have been involved with these two species, but this was the pool that we had. They had to be close enough to the sound and the species that we were dealing with to be giving us expert advice on habitat and habitat quality. And then we had levels of suitable habitat were estimated for Bob White and Squirrel for five year periods over a 50 year planning horizon. And then we had, the way we did this in the survey, we had 14 prescriptions, okay, for by forest type and by silvicultural operations. And we presented to these wildlife professionals in a survey format, which one do you think would be, we actually had five habitat levels, one being very low and five being very high. And we asked them to say, which one do you think would be best suited for this species, given that we're gonna be dealing with this section of, of forest land in the state of Mississippi? And how do you think that would pan out? And they gave us back their, their results and like I said, we've developed it into five classes of suitable habitat. In, in the um, Spectrum 2.5, like I said, it's a USDA Forest Service software. It's a matrix development process. Uh, it took a long time. I don't know if it's any different now or even if uh, Spectrum exists, but you know, it took Becky an awful long time to build the models and get them to work appropriately. Forest Service was interested in that though because they knew it wasn't a perfect a modeling system. It's linear program based. We also have this thing called CWIS Optimizer because once we had all our data entered into the spectrum, we had to optimize for net present value and for uh, habitat. So just to summarize here, we created a model of the central FIA region and the North Central Hills physiographic uh, region. The other thing about using FIA data it worked very well, it linked very well with the Forest Service's own modeling program. So I don't know if MIFI, I would love to do the study over again using the MIFI data, but I don't know how conducive MIFI would be with, with using Spectrum. And I don't know if there's anything that could replace Spectrum. Anyway, so we had the North Central Hills. What we did here is we had industry and non-industrial ownerships in this area and we combined them, okay? We've done other studies where we separated industry and non-industrial, and we also included government. So we had some of the, um, for some of the endangered species studies we did, we had it by opportunity cost by ownership. But for this one here, we just combined it into industrial and non-industrial, okay? Okay, so we wanted to ma maximize specific habitat levels. Um, in the subsequent models off the base model, and then look at the monetary differences. I'm not going to go over this in detail. Uh, the analysis units are based on the FIA data. This data was input into the model, and so you put in your FIA data, because what happens is, with this model, you have a picture of 1994, and depending upon what civil cultural activities you do, and you can have a suite of activities for each habitat level, the forest gets cut or thinned, you know, harvested, clear cut or thinned or whatever you want to do, and then it grows the forest. So one thing that I don't talk about too much here is we were able to get inventory reports by five year periods. We were tracking the inventory in this area so that we knew the inventory we started. Now, say for Bob White, you know, you, you can actually, you might say when you see some of these numbers, oh, you're losing money for Bob White. Well, probably in the long run, you, there's an opportunity cost for sure. But on some of this stuff in the beginning, in order to get the forest converted to an area that you would like it to be to get quality uh, Bob White ha uh, habitat, you have to cut a, a lot of um, timber. And, you know, in some cases, you're making money over and above the net present value from just timber. Okay, and then yield tables with timber and one life coefficients. So in other words, for every, uh, if you look at this uh, five year period right here, um, you can see that we're getting, uh, and that says bobcat, which it should, uh, well that was part of another study, but we inputted all the stuff, it's got squirrel and it's got bob white, and it tells you how much uh, yields for sword timber, for example, uh, per year. So. You know, we're doing different things in this large land base and you're always cutting something and then other areas are not being cut. Okay, so here's the comparison of available bobwhite quail habitat acres we're maximizing 
MPV, maximizing for low air quality. What we decided to do when we presented this stuff is we weren't going to take the extreme of one being very poor quality, because even if you didn't do anything, uh, you probably have at least some quality. It's more realistic to look at a, a low level um, in terms of quality by taking a level two, and we weren't going to go all the way up to five. We were going to say within reason you would want level uh, four uh, for that. And these are the acres that you could produce. So if I'm maximizing my net present value and I'm producing a lower quality bobwhite uh, habitat, I can only do that on about 100,000 acres. Okay, if I just wanted to look at it without any economic constraints of the model, I can get up to a low, almost 160, 1 million, 1.6 million acres for maximizing uh, uh, Bob 2, just without the NPV uh, constraint. And then again, if I'm doing it for high quality NPV, I can get a little bit more uh, acreage. And then if I do it just on trying to maximize with this land base now, you're given the land base with a certain resource, you get up to uh, about 800,000 acres. For the gray squirrel, the numbers are kind of similar. Won't go all over. All of them, you know, you're maximizing your PV, you're producing a low level uh, habitat, um, and then you're maximizing NPV again and producing a, a higher habitat. Okay, comparison of NPV with maximizing NPV or maximizing for low or high quality bobcat in terms of dollars over the 50 year planning horizon. And you can see when you maximize NPV only without consideration of habitat, you're going to make more money. And when you maximize for uh, bottom white for a low level, you're going to make more money because there's less things, obviously, for this species on this land base that you need to do. So you're cutting more timber, and, and your, your concerns for bottom white are there, but they're not uh, maxed out in terms of quality. Obviously, if you want to create a, a, a large level of um, <coughs> a high quality bob, bob white uh, habitat, you can uh, <coughs> you make less money, but uh, you're still doing okay. Maximizing MPV for the squirrel, and then the same thing when you go to a lower level, you're making less money, but you're making a fair amount of money, and then also you're maximizing for high quality over there on the right. Okay. This is the table that I think is, yeah. What's the acreage, land, the unit, the area? The total acres? I knew the, the, for those $10,000, $20,000, that's per what unit of, of area? You mean, you mean what are, are the North Central Hills, and then what is the no, forest? No, you're making $20,000, is that per acre, per? No, that's gross, over the 50 year planning on all the private uh, land holdings. On how many acres? Uh, I knew you were going to ask that. I forget the number of acres. <laughs> I thought about it when I was sitting here. I forget what the North Central Hills forest land acre is, acreage is for industrial and non-industrial, but it's in the paper. So, but anyway, what we did do is we did take the acres, and you could probably backtrack it here. We did it on a per acre basis. So basically net present value, um, and, and we, we look at LEV, which is land expectation value. Actually, if you're uh, comparing investments, you need to do LEV. It's just a variation of NPV, but it doesn't consider land costs. And so basically, if you look at just a consideration for a landowner who wants to have a net present value, okay, that's how much the, L the LEV is 1981. EIA is the uh, equivalent annual income. That's how much money you need to earn per acre to break even over the 50 years. And of course, there's no revenue foregone because you made as much money as you possibly could. Now, if you did uh, Bob White on a high level and low level, you see the numbers drop off. And you, if you go over there, the revenue in dollars per acre per year, okay, fall off. And Scott, you were asking about you know, this is a willingness to pay. This is how much you have to give up as a landowner if your primary concern was Bob White. Now, Bob White's a little bit different, and the wildlifers in here know a little bit more than I do. On some of the species we did, we knew that when we were maximizing um, habitat for a, a key species, that there were a whole suite of species that came along. And there are some uh, that come along with the Bob White, so it's not just singularly individual species. Uh, maybe if you had something very specific, 
Uh, you could say, well, it's just that, that species alone. But the bottom line here is you're giving up about $50 an acre per year over the 50-year horizon. So a landowner can look at this and say, this is a broad brush now and not so specific. You can use this model to get a little bit more specific. But someone might say, you know, an industrial owner would say, well, that's a lot of money per acre. And I don't know if that's worth it to us. Uh, if the government is thinking about doing something with one of the farm bill programs, maybe they could use this as some kind of a measure for compensation. Okay? If, you know, you're a private landowner, you might look at that and say, you know, I like Bob White, and I, like, I want to hunt Bob White on my property, and it's worth $50 an acre to me, or I could lease it out, and who knows? For Bob White Quail Hunting, you might be able to surpass $50. Norman. I apologize, but is That's okay. the... It is the uh, SQR4, does that mean that is perfect habitat for squirrel and SQR2 is pretty good habitat? <clears throat> SQR5 would be perfect habitat. Four was what we viewed as being reasonable because in this world you could never reach the yeah. ideal. And one would be the, uh, not, not a total disregard, but it would be less than two. Okay. okay. So, you know, basically, you know, the measures here are similar. You can, whether you agree with the, the uh, method or not, um, you know, here we are giving up, you know, if you're giving up almost twice as much for a higher quality habitat than for a lower quality. And the same thing was true on the squirrel. Uh, for most of the species we looked at, it was that way. I can tell you right now, for the endangered species, the values were higher. There were some species, though, that we did where actually you didn't give up anything because even in a 50-year horizon, you were actually cutting the forest a lot more um, because, and generating a lot more income. So it depends on what you start with. Uh, so if you're reflecting back to where you live and you don't live in the North Central Hills, or if you work for an agency in the North Central Hills, it could be totally different. The inventory data could be better. But I think this is a fair comparison since it showed up every time we did the study and it was viewed in some of the literature that has been done since the, at that time. So the baseline, uh, the conclusions here, the baseline scenario uh, is which maximize MPV, produce higher LEVs and EAIs per acre and fewer acres of available habitat. You saw that those acres there, there were fewer acres. Uh, and we view this, and, and I have had requests for the article from different places, uh, because there hasn't been a lot of this done. And uh, useful information for landowners, forest managers, policy makers, if you're trying to say, well, how much do we pay them, you know, to produce more habitat as an agency? You know, well, this could be a measure that you could use. Uh, so, you know, we want to compare non-timber uses in terms of opportunity costs. And like I said, in some cases, revenues are foregone by the added benefits of wildlife. I put in fee hunting here, but as you well know, there's other benefits that don't involve dollars. You just may want to have habitat. Now, that may manifest itself in a dollar value, and I think we'll have a talk on that later, because by creating this habitat, you're creating an increased value on your land base. But I'm not going to get into that, because I know somebody's going to build on that, I think, later on in the study. So my main point here is there is a cost, and don't think that there isn't a cost most times by creating wildlife habitat. The question is, what's the benefit? There's dollars and non-dollar benefits. And uh, whether you're from an agency perspective, a small landowner, or an industry, you have to make that decision on your own. That's why you need a management plan. So any other questions? This was a WUR funding utilization. I probably went over my time, yeah. So I better get out of here before my uh, former student here kicks me off. Thank you, Dr. Grady. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, the good thing about our, our schedule, of course, is that tomorrow afternoon we've got a good block of time reserved for the panel discussions where we really can answer a lot of questions and chase it like that. So our next speaker today is Dr. Daryl Jones, who's a professor in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Aquaculture at MSU, and uh, one of the few professors I know that rides a bike to work a lot of times. 
Thanks, Scott. Great to be here. Everybody hear me? Okay. The screen up here that Scott got, he's got better eyes than me. It's minuscule, so I'm sorry I have to look back to see what I'm talking about. Uh, this study, uh, the, the, ri the original version of it, the, the genesis of it, came from perspective of a lot of the work that y'all do. I'm an old ex-banker from Vicksburg as well, and work, like Scott said, at the Department of Water and State now, an extension professor. Uh, Jeannie Jones, my big sister's involved with this. Jerry Bashir is a PhD student. Uh, this is his data set for his dissertation. And then also Steve Grado, you just heard from, and Ian Munn are uh, key involvement as well in this study. Um, one of the, the, the reasons for this study, and as y'all well know, I think, we have a good understanding, I think, in Mississippi and many agricultural and forestry driven type states. Uh, like our own, of the value of property due to timberland, uh, timber resources, and ag ground, including aquaculture. What we didn't see a lot of work done, though, was on what the recreational value is. Scott, your question, what's the value of wildlife uh, and outdoor recreation, and what does that add to the balance sheet for a landowner? So this was an attempt to get at that looking at land valuation in Mississippi, what is the additional value that outdoor recreation drives into that land value, if any. So that's what this study is about. As a precursor, I hope my numbers don't uh, misjive of what Tetrick already said, but as many of you know, we have about 20 million acres of forest in Mississippi, with over 12 million of that's in private ownership. Almost 12 million acres of farm ground in Mississippi with a little over 4 million that are in harvestable cropland or, or row crops. And about, uh, depending on the source you look at, about four million acres in wetlands and bottomland hardwood forest, wetland forest in Mississippi, which obviously is an asset that we have, not only from a timber resource, water quality, but also, as many of you know, Scott knows, being a turkey hunter, for sure, as wildlife recreation of those types of properties. And then our farm bill programs, obviously you know Mississippi as well, our farmers are involved with these types of programs and put once farmed wetlands back into more native natural covers is the idea behind uh, CRP and WRP lands. We have a million and growing depending on what the new farm bill will be. Uh, some economic numbers that were generated at the university with various folks from wildlife ventures, agriculture, and forestry involved in this study. Uh, these were numbers that were actually taken from um, the 2006 Park of Interior Fish and Wildlife Service survey of hunting, fishing, and wildlife associated recreation, and then econometrics modeling into that to see what the economic impact to the state of Mississippi is. 1.2 billion annually in hunting, uh, almost 700 million in fishing, angling, wildlife watching being a sleeper and a growing one worldwide in Mississippi as well. Uh, almost 800 million spent uh, there, and then with a total impact of about 2.7 billion, creating uh, over 7,000 jobs. So this study, again, looking back to what I said earlier, was getting at what the value in Mississippi rural lands might be as a result from folks wanting to buy those kind of properties for outdoor recreation. And in Mississippi, a lot of that, particularly in this study, ended up being hunting. But that could be other, other recreational act activities and in other, other states, some different activities. So limited, there was limited information on this type of information out there. And does, does outdoor recreation even influence land sales and values in the state? What effects, if any, do the, the types of land, ag ground as compared to forest land, as compared to fallow, fallow land, uncultivated land, what are those types of lands? Species involved with different types of wildlife species, the game species, do they have some influence on the recreation and therefore the value? And then this notion of wildlife related recreation, what does it have, if any, on sales of land in, in Mississippi? And then what are those factors that may drive those values? So we developed a questionnaire. The first study we did was in 2005 and had about 100 properties in it. This has been a, a, a larger study which we had a similar survey developed by the office that you saw listed, and we worked as the, as the source of information. Federal Land Bank was a primary uh, 
helper in this study to uh, that answered the surveys on, on on loans that they were booking to finance the purchase of properties in the state. Mossio properties involved and also in some investment companies, one mentioned out of Memphis Rutledge Investment Company. And so the inventory was on property sales, the the restrictions it had to be the property had to be located in Mississippi. Sales by chance in this study occurred between 03 and 05 it, uh, that from the database, the loan database and portfolios of primarily the federal land bank. And then that outdoor recreation was noted by the buyer of the property that was, in this case, financed by a broker or a bank. Outdoor recreation was a reason for the purchase. What information did we obtain? I mentioned some of this, I'll briefly quickly. Land uses and, and cover types, ag ground, forest, other fallow, fallow ground, uh, potential recreation uses of on the property and the location, what counties, uh, from the property we got, we got 81 of 82 counties were represented in the database, so it's all over the state. Game species that were perceived to be present. There was no wildlife inventory when we did um, camera surveys or anything like that. It's just what, what game species are perceived to be on the properties. Good deer, deer habitat, turkeys on the place, that kind of information. That was noted by the bank, uh, the bank uh, portfolio, by the bankers themselves. Cost share participation, if any, what amenities on the property, um, water, electricity, road access, and then the purchase prices of the property and then a calculation to determine what the value would have been if recreation was not considered. And then if whether any of the properties were leased, leased for hunting. So some of the results, over 800 properties were, were collected and from the database, made 81 counties that I mentioned earlier. It totaled uh, over 250,000 acres in the state overall. The distribution, by area of the state, about 60% of the land area in the study was in the Delta, 25% in the north, northern counties as in east of the Delta and up to the Tennessee line, and then south Mississippi, more central Mississippi, Jackson south to the, to the lower coastal plain were the three areas. So you can see the distribution line share in the Delta. Forest land cover statewide, 71% of the cover. This is interesting. In the Delta, still 70% of the land sales were forested <coughs> ground in the Delta. And obviously, row crop ag ground are your dominant land type here, but people were selecting these forests to buy for recreation. Some more results on the, just the breakdown of cover types across Mississippi. Natural pine, you can see upland hardwood, bottomland hardwood, pine, mixed pine hardwood, planted pine, and total forested tracks. Again, uh, the number of tracks, over 700 tracks in the data set, data set for forested land, about 180,000 acres total. Notice bottomland hardwood is one of the larger players, almost 60,000 acres on 131 tracks. By recall, I think there were about 15 tracks that were 500 acres and above that were sold primarily for recreational purposes, on an average of about 450 acres uh, per, per track. You see the, see the breakdown in different types of land cover, forested land cover there. And planted pine, 154 tracks, about 171 acres a piece, and that makes sense, that's, that's uh, across the state. What are some of the results for the land use from recreation? Hunting was a, was a primary, primary reason for buying and using the ground, using the property, or what's truck riding to a smaller degree and wildlife watching. What were the wildlife game species that were perceived to be on the tracks? Deer, obviously, was an important factor. 95% of tracks had, were, had perceived white tailed deer. Uh, turkey on about 85%. Waterfowl, 20% of the parcel state wide, but the waterfowl was a larger um, player, if you will, in the Delta with 45% of the tracks perceived that there were ducks conducting opportunities on, on the ground. Buyers and residents, where did these folks come from? Over 60% from Mississippi, a lot from Louisiana. Being from Vicksburg, Mike, you want to be able to answer some Tully. Uh, we had to run Louisiana folks out of Vicksburg coming and buying all the hunting ground around Warren County. So that, that's something Delta folks are quite used to, but Louisiana folks still active in it. And then 5% from Georgia. So Atlanta's coming this way, we're gonna all live in Atlanta one day, I guess. So. <laughs> 
14% of the property just thought you might be interested were leased for hunting, about um, a little over about 112 properties. And these, these properties, which were higher level habitat, if you will, for game species particularly, and managed that way and then sold, they on average earned over $20 an acre in lease values. So Scott getting some of the value, the more recent values. And the mean track size are a little over 180 acres. A different tidbit here that I pulled from a different data set that I thought might interest you. In my extension work, I work with the Natural Resource Enterprises Program. We give landowners technical advice and business related advice involving hunting, leasing hunting land and starting natural resource enterprise, fee hunting operation, bird watching type operations, this type of uh, businesses. And the majority, we do surveys with those past NRE uh, landowner uh, participants, and the majority of the forest stands that they own and put into NRE type businesses are older stands. 30 years and greater. And so that their money resource comes from the timber utility of that, but also these, these properties, and a lot of this is closed canopy hardwoods. These are lands that are, that are primarily driving the money in terms of turkey hunting, green tree reservoir, waterfowl in the delta, these types of activities. So again, this older, older mature stands is what primarily are involved, these landowners are putting in these NRE type businesses. Back to the, the data set here, we found that 51% increase in sales proceeds were, was due to wildlife rec outdoor recreation. <laughs> in 2005, the number was 36%, so it's a little bit of a bump here in the, in the value of rural lands in Mississippi just due to outdoor recreation, which adds to the tax assessors don't figure that out, it'd be a good thing, but it adds to the balance sheet for a landowner in addition to his timber resource or her uh, agricultural resource, you've got wildlife recreation, outdoor recreation that you can lease land and have these types of NRA businesses. Represented about a $600 increase per acre and take an aggregate over all the properties, about $160 million in sales proceeds due to outdoor recreation. This is a uh, land cover that Steve actually mentioned er earlier from Dr. Schultz, Matney, and Dr. Evans. Dr. Evans actually prepared this graphic in Midby, the Mississippi Inventory Forest Inventory, Institute Forest Inventory, showing ages of various forest types in the, in the state. And you can see, again, getting back to that notion, getting back on the horse of the older <coughs> age class timber stands, particularly in the hardwoods that you'll see, the bottomland hardwoods in the Delta along these watersheds, in the, in the Mississippi Delta, and the Pascagoula, the Pearl River, you'll see those darker green <coughs> colorations showing those, those older stands of timbers. But there's not a whole lot of it left. And what we're seeing in some of our rural land study, these are the lands that are primarily more, folks from Louisiana are coming to one. Which many of you know that. Looking at regression results, regression modeling to look at, try to predict the total sales price Statewide, I don't want to get wrapped around actually with the numbers, but just to show you some of the players involved in forest land, forest land coverages, you'll see planted pine because a lot of it, and it's obviously used for hunting and leased for hunting. And that natural pine was also a, a significant player or significant variable. Upland hardwood, bottomland hardwood, and mixed pine hardwood. And you'll see in running partial correlation coefficients with rep, which measure the relative weight or overall influence of that particular value on the total sales price of the property, bottom land hardwoods are the driver. Statewide, you see almost 0.9 out of 1.0, a pretty strong indicator that these wetland forests are important due to uh, land values in the state from outdoor recreation. Looking at Delta, there were about 28 counties involved, and one of the reasons I wanted to mention to you, you'll see in the results we've got bombing hardwood as a, as a component, as a factor, mixed pine hardwoods and upland hardwoods. This is bringing in some of the border counties in the de Delta, like Warren County, Lewis Hills, and Bluff counties, um, Carroll County, DeSoto County, that you get into the Choctaw Ridge, you're getting some out of the bottom land. So, Again, these types of hardwood covers are important, are coming out in the model 
for being driving and predicting total sales price of these properties. Again, though, in the Delta Bottom Man Park, we're still a strong player along with some of these other factors. Again, these wetland forests are, are an important player. And then lastly, uh, hopefully I've been able to show you this, and I think you already know, most of you do, forest increase real land sales value. This I think this study is, is showing that. We've done some similar work that has similar results. These types of lands, as you know as well, important habitats for wildlife game species, and these are being used for hunting and rifle recreation. And buyers in state and out of state are seeking these at attributes and buying this type of property. So the forest obviously diversify income from timber resource, also though from the wildlife potential recreation as well. Adds to the balance sheet, adds to the income stream of private landowners. And these types of forests obviously provide wildlife habitat that again fit into higher life quality and income streams. And what I would say to this as well, just again coming put, putting my extension hat back on, um, I think what in, in addition to this study and some of the work I've done with NRE and echoing some other earlier speakers, it depends on the landowner's objectives, what he or she wants to do with their land. That is the primary dri land driver in my mind before I make recommendations to a landowner on their decision making what they do with the property. And these, some, even with wildlife, obviously if I want to increase deer browse, I will probably harvest more for deer browse, to increase deer browse, taking some of the volume out. I personally, I wouldn't do that for eastern wild turkeys, but I'm not going to knock as many holes in those older mature stands because not only for habitat quality, acre production, but also for the quality of experience that my turkey hunt to be able to work, work and see those birds. And that's what our NRE landowners are telling us as well. They're putting these types of properties in, in, into their business. So it depends on landowners' objectives. It's not a one size fits all in my mind with prescriptions of how to manage these types of lands, and we need to keep that perspective, that diversity of perspective in my mind, particularly from an extension standpoint when I, when we work, when I work with landowners. And with that, I enjoyed being here today and would love to entertain any, any questions if I have time. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, time for one. So I'll come in. <clears throat> so I one hand over here back. All the birds. Was there a hand over here? No. Okay, Jake. Did the data set include not only the, the, the value for which it sold, but the value for which it appraised? So maybe we could calculate a difference and see what, what kind of premium it was. James, I don't, I, I think we did have the appraised value of some of the loan portfolio, but not on all of it. It, it ended up, they, they were more worried about what it actually sold for, which is, is you know, appraised value is one thing, it's shady, but the, well, what it sold for is actually what it's worth. In the market, so that that's primarily what we're. we're I'm measuring. trying to get the appraised value might capture the market value. What's yeah. paying for like the value of the land and the timber? Yeah. You subtract what it's <coughs> purchased for, then you have an idea of what those non-market benefits, yeah, for life, recreation well, might be worth. What we did, what we did on that was ask the bankers what it sold for, which may have some of that appraised information in, but what it what the loan booked for, and then their professional opinion what would it have sold for without outdoor recreation even being considered and they knew from interviewing the potential buyers what their motivations were so they was they were working into their calculations what the value was so we were able to remove outdoor recreation and that's what that's what we got our number from was what the banks were seeing what their inventory but that would be something we could add in the future maybe we we'll get you involved in that study and help you please all right Thank you very much. Thank you.